How can our assumptions and attitudes hinder us from sharing Jesus with the non-religious and younger generations? In this episode, I'm joined by Aaron Pierce. Aaron is the CEO and Mission Director for Steiger International. His most recent book is entitled, Not Beyond Reach. Together, Aaron and I look at some of the tightly held assumptions that actually prevent us from pointing the non-religious to the beauty of Jesus Christ. Aaron also helps us understand how we can shift our heart posture so we are not fiercely defending against others' cultural convictions, but rather entering into conversations around some commonly held uncertainties and fears. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, friends, and welcome to another insightful episode of Front Stage Backstage. I am your host, Jason Day. And each and every single week, I have the privilege to sit down with a trusted ministry leader. We dive into a topic on an effort to help you and pastors and ministry leaders just like you embrace a healthy rhythm in both your life and ministry. We are proud to be a part of the Pastor Serve Network. And not only do we have a conversation every single week, but our team also creates a toolkit that complements the conversation that we have. And you can find the toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find a ton of resources, including a ministry leader's growth guide. Now, this growth guide gives you the opportunity Opportunity to dig more deeply into the conversation, has uh, insights and questions that you can work through. And you can also take your local ministry leaders at your church through the, the, the guide as well, give you an opportunity to discuss in more detail the topic uh, that we're diving into. So we encourage you to check that out at pastorserve.org slash network. Now, Pastor Serve, we love walking alongside of ministry leaders. We do this day in and day out. And if you would like to learn how you can receive a complimentary coaching session, you can find more details on that at pastorserve.org slash free session. So be sure to check that out as well. Now, if you're joining us on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. Take a moment to drop your name and the name of your church or ministry in the comment section below. We love getting to know our audience better, and we'll be praying for you and for your ministry. So be sure to drop that in there. And then whether you're joining us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, please be sure to subscribe or follow so you do not miss out on any of these great conversations. I'm excited about today's guest. And this time, I'd like to welcome Aaron Pierce to the show. Aaron, welcome. Thanks, Jason. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to be with you, brother. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the topic that we're going to dive into um, because it's something that is so prevalent right now. Uh, in ministry, uh, especially in the Western church, I think we, I guess the church's commentary on current culture and emerging generations um, tends to be, it seems, somewhat critical, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it seems like every generation yeah. um, thinks they had it a little more dialed in than the next generation, right? Sure. And that's getting kind of progressively worse. And, you know, some people think we're headed to hell in a handbasket type of a thing. And that's just, that's just a lot of the conversation that's taking place uh, within the church right now. And so Aaron, you have invested years. You have, you have a deep history of um, engaging with emerging generations, introducing them to the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of Jesus. And so I would love for you, if you could share this a bit, Aaron, kind of your, your perspective. Um, you're all kind of on the front lines in sure. this space. And so can you talk to us a little bit, what, how do you feel about emerging generations um, you know, where our culture is, where our culture's headed and, and, uh, where Jesus fits into all that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think on one hand, it's hard to dispute the, the reality that younger generations, um, from a statistical perspective, they're, they're not following Jesus at the same levels. They're the, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the religiously unaffiliated. So, and, and not only is it like affiliation, but attitude is changing as well towards the church. So in some ways, like it's, it's somewhat just factual that this generation is not as, uh, they're not as integrated into the church as the past. Um, but I also think, of course, that, that it's not all bad in that some of it has to do with the fact that in previous generations, we largely lived in this kind of Christian nominalism. 
in which many people identified as a Christian. And what that brought with it is, of course, maybe familiarity with the church and openness to come to church on Easter and Christmas, uh, believing the Bible I was a good moral guide and all those good things. Uh, but it, it also created confusion and it also created a sense of I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not really living it. Whereas now it's maybe a more distinct. And, and I think that's an opportunity because if you ask me, one of the greatest barriers to people um, encountering Jesus is that they experience a form of godliness that denies its power. And, and, and I think a lot of nominal Christianity is that. And so when people experience religiosity and moralism and this kind of, you know, this thing that doesn't resonate with them, not because of the form and function, but because it's powerless, it's religious powerless. That I think draw, takes people away more than anything else. So in one sense, I would say it's a positive thing that it's more like th there's a more clear distinction and hopefully a, a clear distinction between the outworking of a secular worldview and the power and the, whole, the, you know, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in Christians. So I think in that sense, that's a positive thing. There's, of course, a lot of positive things about this generation itself. But as far as like the trends and how many young people are no longer following or no longer part of the church, no longer identifies a Christian, I think there's multiple ways to look at that too. Yeah, yeah, Aaron. Now, I, I want to dive into something you said there because I don't want our audience to miss it because um, I, I think you made an incredible point. Um, you talked you said something about that there it's not that they are turned off by necessarily the form and function of what church looks like today which which this is huge Aaron because a lot of people make that assumption and there have been books um conferences all kinds of things <laughs> developed over the last couple decades about how form and function you know how we show up as, as the church what we do how we engage people those types of things as being the the problem right. and therefore we need to to shift that yeah but but what you're saying and I I think this is um you know, present, I, I've got young adult children. And so I, I, I see this in their own lives and in the lives of their friends, right? That, that it's not necessarily the form and function of the church, but is that piece that you mentioned that that almost um, a false view of what, you know, God and Jesus were all about that does not connect um, because there's, there's something inauthentic about it. So Aaron, I'd love for you to dive in a little more on, on, on that point right there. Cause I think it's something we don't want to miss. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Sometimes we, we get hung up on the superficial in the sense of like, if we just get the music right or we make it look cool, then we're going to connect. And, and I certainly, there's a way to be, you know, stylistically relevant to someone, but I don't think that's the fundamentals of it. I don't think that's the issue. I think what it is, is people need to see how the gospel um, is relevant to their lives, how the gospel transforms their lives, how it's the basis for authentic community. It's the basis for, you know, the greatest fundamental needs of my life are uh, healing and, and relational reconciliation and forgiveness. And, and that in Jesus, that is the ultimate source of those things. So it's making the gospel relevant. And, and I think that word relevance gets confused because mm -hmm. relevance can sometimes mean putting on a costume and using the right Gen Z slang. <laughs> and, and I don't think that's what it's about. It's about making the gospel understandable. So my, my background, my, I grew up as a missionary kid and, you know, a missionary is all about making the gospel relevant or contextualizing it for a foreign culture so that not so that you compromise it, water it down or anything like that. You make it understandable. And I think the challenge for us is how do we contextualize the gospel for younger generation? And the reason it's important is because the younger generation has a different set of assumptions about the world than previous generations. And communication is all about assumptions. Mm -hmm. If I know what you believe and the assumptions you have, I can speak to that. I can challenge it or I can build off of it. But when we are using assumptions from the past in the US context, it's usually kind of a nominal Christian nation assumption. And now I'm speaking to a post-Christian person, a secularized person, they, it doesn't often resonate, it doesn't connect. And so the challenge is how do we learn to communicate the gospel, the the, the, which is like the thing that people, whether they know it or not, are looking for. Um, but how do you communicate it in a way that they can understand? And that's, to me, what relevance is about. Not about, you know, because you'll find young people are actually drawn to all sorts of things. Some of them are drawn to very traditional forms and functions. And, and so that's really not the point. It's how to communicate it in a way that connects.
Yeah, that, that's good, Aaron. And in your most recent book, Not Beyond Reach, uh, you really lean into this idea of what does it look like to contextualize the gospel um, for younger generations, emerging generations? What, what does it mean to engage with someone who is non-religious, right? Who is post-Christian? And, and that's, that's absolutely key. So talk to us a bit, Aaron, if you would, about what are some key things that we need to kind of relearn perhaps, mm. right? So that we don't make those assumptions that lead us down a path that just frustrates us and frustrates the people uh, that we're connecting with. But, but what are some of the, the fresh things that we need to consider when it comes to engaging with younger generations today? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. I think one of the, cult, the challenges that we have today is that not just young people, most people have become increasingly suspicious of religious institutions and frankly suspicious of all institutions. Like that's an issue, right? We don't trust the media like we used to. We don't trust the government. We, and we also don't trust the church like mm -hmm. we used to. And there are reasons for it, right? And some that, that that's played into it. But the fact is people don't have the same trust of religious institutions and they're far less likely to come to a church event. So you're dealing with that. And, and, and I think that's relevant because a lot of our models for evangelism and for reaching culture in the past was bring them to church. And, and like, like, let's, it's like, we'll create the space where they can encounter Jesus in the context of a church. And today you're kind of putting an extra barrier in the way and people need to meet Jesus on, on his own terms before they're ready to understand the point of the church. And, and so I think sometimes this, that's a challenge because a lot of our evangelism is based on come to us, come and see, bring your friend. The, uh, the other thing is, again, I mentioned already, because many people ha don't have the same assumptions about truth and morality and the the nature of God and the the authority of the Bible. Um, I, like I can I can say to someone, a secular university student, and I could say, hey, if you were to die today and stand before God in heaven, and He were to judge your life, would He let you in? Well, I'm just presupposing a whole bunch of things that they probably don't hold to be true, or or I could quote scripture as as authority. And, and by that, I, you know, like clearly scripture is the, I believe the scripture is the word of God. It is authoritative. It's infallible, all of that. But when I'm talking to a secular person and I kind of say, well, the Bible says X, therefore Y, I'm, I'm not connecting because they have to assume that the Bible is an authority. What I can do is I can show that the Bible is true by connecting it to their to their experience in life that it's verifiable and that it actually it's so it's kind of like you have to approach it from a different way you know where so often we kind of take it from a the bible's authoritative therefore but rather i can say well actually you experience this and the bible speaks into this it explains your longings it explains your experience it explains the brokenness in our world in a way that you see all around you the bible explains that in the like nothing else and so it's it's a different way of approaching a secular culture because of the assumptions i would say the last thing if i can is despite all of that we have a culture that is very much open to spirituality and so most are not cold hard atheists most are very open to spirituality so there's tremendous opportunity to engage in spiritual conversations because people are very open to that. They're, they don't believe that the world is just kind of cold, hard accident and life's just about pursuing pleasure, avoiding pain, and the end I'm gonna be in the dirt. They believe there's gotta be more. So these are some of the opportunities I think that we have in engaging this culture. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's very helpful, Aaron. And what's interesting is there is that openness, there is that desire to, to look for something bigger than ourselves. We see this in emerging generations. Um, but oftentimes we trip up because we, the, our starting place is completely different from their starting place. Yep. And yep. so there has to be this recognition and we have to find the, that, that common ground. Yep. Uh, Aaron, what are, what are some of the ways that, that you have found over the years and uh, that you write about in, in your book that, that we can kind of find that common ground, that place to start uh, the conversation and begin the relationship with someone? Well, I think that there are so many things that we have in common with people that, you know, it, it can be very superficial things, but I think that, you know, we all desire belonging and connection. We all desire purpose. And so much of what you see in the world is trying to find belonging and acceptance and purpose in things other than God when they don't know him. Right. And so those are places of deep connections. Uh, you know, I think, and, and 
we might get into this, but I think there are so many things that we make divisive, like politics and and other issues that that we have, social justice and all sorts of things. It gets very divisive, but we recognize actually there's incredible opportunities to find c points of connection. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's part of it is um, there's a tendency, I think, for us, you know, the U.S. has seen a, de a decline in Christian influence and kind of some moral decay and some ideologies that are going on that are pretty wild. And so the tendency is like, well, maybe I need to isolate or put my fists up. Mm. And and so we can we can have a defensive posture when actually people beneath the conviction that people have them their moral convictions and all this there's actually beneath that not too deep beneath that there's actually a lot of confusion and there's a lot of um, brokenness and so if you can kind of see beneath the surface a little bit and be patient you'll find that when you connect with people there's a lot there that you can relate to and that people are really searching they're just often searching for those things that god has to put in us in the wrong places yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's good, Aaron. Aaron, let, let's let's lean in a little bit to some of those more divisive, um, you know, conversations, topics, those types of things. Because because in the book, you you really um, highlight that those are areas that are ripe for engagement, um, and oftentimes, and you said this a little bit, we we tend to put our fists up, we tend to get defensive, we we get angry over um, uh, politics, we get angry mm -hmm. over sexuality issues, mm -hmm. we get mm -hmm. angry over all these things. And, and mm -hmm. so we're like shouting about them. Mm -hmm. um, but you posit that there might be a different posture that we take, yep. rather than getting angry, um, prayerfully seeing where is God at work in those issues. Yep. And so, Aaron, if we could, let, let's just step through some of them. Let, let's, since it's an election year and things are crazy, <laughs> let's go with politics first. Yep. Um, there's no question that over the last decade or so, politics has become one of the most divisive things yep. um, in our country and even in the church. Yep. Right. I mean, it's 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 heartbreaking in so many ways. And so, Aaron, when we look at the issue of politics, how how can we change our posture from you know getting defensive? fighting, you know, finger wagging, finger pointing, whatever, to seeing the opportunity um, to, to, you know, highlight the beauty of Jesus yep. in, in those conversations. Yep. I, I think it starts with um, uh, maybe a paradigm shift in my own mind. Sometimes it's something I understand conceptually, but it really hasn't gone down to my heart. And when it comes to politics, I think, you know, again, because of all that's going on in our culture, um, a lot of the Christian response to all that's going on in our culture has been characterized by fear. And we've responded to, you know, the moral decay and the, the attacks on, you know, you know, traditional views on sexuality and this and that. We've responded with fear. And, and so that, that fear is, is, again, caused us like we've got to fight against this. And, and certainly we need to address that. But I think the, the challenge is when we see the that politics is going to be the solution or that's where we're putting our hope and some it's a really subtle thing because we most of us realize politics is not where we should put our hope but but the truth is like our hope is not in uh this country it's not in our religious freedom it's not in the you know the tax benefits the church has our hope is in none of that so yes while we certainly want to defend those things we don't put an existential hope in those things and if that's true i can approach people and these issues in a different way because if it is an existential threat then i need to fight it at all with all means possible and including you know then then you kind of get into the 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 means justify the ends kind of mentality um but if if my mentality is no my hope isn't in that 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 no matter what happens i have hope in jesus it changes my posture it kind of takes i can kind of relax a little bit and i can approach people with more patience and grace and then realize that actually politics on a personal level not on a like a policy level but on a personal level is an incredible opportunity for a spiritual conversation because politics, if you think about a lot of young people are very socially, uh, socially active in some way, and often it's not very biblically aligned. But nonetheless, when you think about someone that's like passionate about anything, including like environmentalism, which is big or or LGBTQ rights or whatever, um, what you what you can see in them is, number one, someone like that is 
they believe the world is not as it ought to be. And as a follower of Jesus, you're like, amen. Mm. You know, and so that's actually a deep point of connection. You can say, I, I, you know, you're right. This world is messed up. And I think that's actually one of the distinctions between today's younger person versus maybe 15 years ago. 15 years ago, there was more of, and I think it kind of related to like tech optimism, um, but there was like more of this sense like of everything's cool, everything's progressing, everything's going great. And now there's like, man, anxiety and depression and war and this and that. And so there's what, what people are seeing is man the world's broken and if for, if you're going to understand the gospel you have to accept that the world is broken right and that we need so and and then the question is man what what is the solution to this is the solution you know is there is there truly a political solution to this and and what you'll find is that people when they really resonate with that they say no there's something deeper something deeper going on here and so that that combined with the reality is that socially act people that are activists they want to do something about the brokenness of the world. And that too is something God's put in them, right? They've, God's put in us a mission. Even if we don't yet know Jesus, that, that, that good works that we were created for in advance is in them. And so that, that speaks to the fact that our lives have purpose. And so all these things, whether it's that this world is broken or that our lives matter and that we should have purpose and all these things are connections to the gospel in really profound and visceral ways. And politics and social justice speak to it really powerfully. Yeah, that, that's good. Super helpful, Aaron. Um, how, how do you how do you um, navigate through a situation when uh, a young person might say, well, really, I think one of the big things that's wrong with the church or wrong with the world, rather, is the church and how the church has has kind of expressed itself and how the church is even expressing itself today. Sure. Like that And that's complicated. And you have to ask, what do you mean by that? Right. Right. Like it can mean different things for different people. I think sometimes people use that as a smokescreen for other things. I think a lot of people um, walk away from the church because of church hurt. And because, you know, I, I think that a couple of things I'd say to that one is, the, of course, there's a flawed idea of, of, of if we expect the church you know, to be perfect, and we, they've got a flawed understanding of the gospel, clearly. Um, that, that said, the church, sadly, does not live up to our ideals often, so there is a reckoning there. I, I, think, I think one of the big things that we need to create space for is we live in, in, in kind of cancel culture in general, but within the church, we've created our own kind of cancel culture, which is if someone brings up a a hard question or a doubt or or struggles with the kind of a like a, a hard doctrine like the doctrine of hell or something like that and and we we see that as immediately dangerous and and like heretical and we kind of shut that down we're actually hurting people we need to create a space for people to process those hard questions within the context of the church including what do we do when churches hurt people? Or what do we do when good Christians do things that are in a, out of alignment with that? We need to create a space for people to process that, not hide from it, not gloss over it, not dismiss those doubts as and, you know, kind of keep those doubters away from the other ones so they don't infect them. I actually think that cr creating a space to process those doubts creates a resilience in your faith that you can't achieve any other way. Yeah, that, that's good, Aaron. And that's uh, that's a lot more authentic, too, rather than pretending like, oh, we've got it all figured out or, you know, just don't look right? Mm -hmm. you know, shield your eyes. You know, we'll, we'll get this figured out. It's this idea of inviting people into. Yeah, we, we're we're broken people, too. We're trying to figure this out. We know that there's brokenness in the world. There's brokenness in the church um, and invites them into to a space where they can wrestle through some of their own doubts. So I, yep. I think that's great. Aaron, another hot um a hot button issue is, uh, and we it's talked about a little bit or, or reference it, and that is um, sexual identity, mm -hmm. these types of things, sexuality as a whole. Yep. Um, and, and this is something that uh, younger generations are very passionate about. We see this. Yep. Uh, how do you recommend we, um, again, uh, engage in these conversations in a winsome way that helps yep. them see the beauty of Christ. Yeah, that's it's it's probably our biggest challenge today in the church, reaching this next generation. So many young people walk away because of, of that issue, or because you're telling me that my gay friend is you know going to hell. That that's a big issue, um, and I think that it's I shouldn't I don't I don't want to come across like it's easy to solve because it's not. Um, I think it's hard because it's been tied to people's identity, right? And this isn't just something I you know. I, I experience or whatever. It's my who I am. And so it's a big challenge. Um, I think the biggest thing we have to overcome in our culture first and foremost is um, the, the, the kind of the, 
the foundation we have to build is, is it possible for me to love you and not agree with everything that you do and, and everything that you believe? Like, I think that's actually the fundamental thing I have to address before I can even get into the biblical view on sexuality. Can, is it possible for me to love you and not affirm everything that you believe in how you live? And because and the truth is, in reality, that it's impossible to love someone and, and then affirm everything about them. Like as a dad, I don't do that with my kids, right? My, my five-year-old would have been hit by a car if, by now if he just got to go wherever he wanted and eat whatever he wanted. He would have been candy and running on the streets, right? So the I, idea that I can love you and not agree with everything for you is kind of the foundation you have to build because it, 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 as with anything, this stuff has to be worked out in relationship um, and trust. And you can't build that relationship if you can't get to the place where, hey, I love you no matter what, even if I don't agree with you, even if I don't think this is good for you. And that's fundamentally what we believe. Like our view on sexuality is not about control or limiting freedom or fun. It's about operating our, our lives in a way that's in alignment with God's way so that we thrive. Um, but I can't even get there until I can have a relationship. And I can't have a relationship until I can get to the place where I love you, even if I don't agree with you. So I think it often starts right there. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. So let's let's lean in a little bit more on that. Um, when we're engaging with, with people who, you know, really are like, hey, love is love, you know, these type mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. what, how do we, um, you know, we're, we're establishing a relationship with them. How do we continue to to build that relationship in such a way that invites ongoing conversation? Yep. Yeah, I think that's the and that this doesn't just relate to spiritual uh, sexuality. This is related to any topic. But it's it's the 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 big thing that we're that I'm pushing in this book is is in, develop friendships with with secular people, with people that wouldn't walk into a church, whether it's a a gay person or whatever. Develop authentic friendships. And the whole challenge there is love does not equal affirmation. I can love someone and not affirm. But then realize that if you're developing a real friendship, like so much of life has spiritual implications. And how do I begin to draw out spiritual implications of everyday life? Like love and love is love, which is a kind of a confusing circular statement is a great question about, well, what is love? What does love mean? You know, and, and begin to question love and cause is love just accept all things or does love say, no, there's some things that are good and then there are some things that are not good. And I can begin to set the foundation for a moral framework, not based on a angry, judgeful, judging God, but a God that is compassionate and wants good things for his children. And so a moral framework is we're reshaping morality. And so everything has spiritual implications and, and you just need to, through friendship and spiritual conversations, begin to challenge the, the, what I talk about in the book is you're, you're basically looking for four things. You're looking for idols in their life. You're looking for felt needs that they have, and you're, and you're looking for lies and truth. And so idols, what are those things that they're putting their hope in that will fail them? And to begin to challenge those things. And, you know, it could be I put my identity, my hope in a relationship or, you know, or I've got a felt need of loneliness that I'm trying to fill that loneliness somehow. Or I believe, and again, you, you, you begin to challenge those things and it, it starts to clear away the things that stand in the way of Jesus and the cross. Because fundamentally what they need is Jesus and the cross, not a, a moral lifestyle change. They need to meet Jesus and surrender their lives to him and, and accept, for, accept what he did on the cross for them. But sometimes there's so much garbage in the way that you can clear away through spiritual conversations over time. And as you build trust, you can begin to speak into people's life. And, and what you'll find, including people in the, in the LGBTQ scene, is that they're, they're not as convicted as you think they are. They're not as, there's, there's questions and cons doubts going on underneath. And as you build relationships, you get to speak into that and bring truth into that. So yeah, I, I guess that's how I'd answer all that. Yeah, yeah, Aaron. And I think it's a great reminder um, for us that you've touched on this a couple of times in this conversation, the idea that um, beneath people's um, beliefs or their current convictions, um, there is a lot of confusion. There, yep. there are a lot of questions. There's a yep. lot of searching, yep. no matter how much they might present, like they've got it figured mm -hmm. out on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's just common to human nature. Yep. And, and if we can um, kind of avoid attacking that surface level, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Level yep. conviction. And if we can, um, you know, honestly, just, 
ask some questions and try to dig in a little bit more deeply and build that trust, of, as yep. you said, um, you know, can open some r real doors for, yep. for Jesus in their lives. Yeah, and I think it's it's a posture thing. And it's also a confidence. It's a confidence that Jesus is who he says he is. And, and so when I approach people, um, rather than trying to convince them I'm right, I encourage them to pursue the truth, which is very different. And, and, and it's different because my posture towards them is like, let's just, well, let's, I just want to know what's true and let's pursue that. Let's, and an honest pursuit of truth will lead to Jesus. It'll open their hearts to Jesus. And so I don't have to convince them. I just have to ask questions and honestly pursue truth together and also have some humility. The fact that I don't know everything and that I'm still on a journey, even as I know what is true, I can still have some humility about about learning and walk with people. And, and that posture, I think, makes a big difference. Yeah, I love that, Aaron. I love that. Awesome. It's been a great conversation. A couple things before we wrap up. One is um, your newest book, Not Beyond a Reach. Uh, what's the best way that people can connect um, with you, with your ministry, um, and, and get the book? Well, if you want to get the book, you can go, we're, we're working with Living on the Edge, Chip Ingram. Um, that's who we publish it through. So you can go to Living on the Edge or LOTE.org to get the book. Um, if you want to learn more about Siger, which is the organization that I lead, which is our, we're a global missionary movement all about mobilizing followers of Jesus to reach young people who would not walk into a church. You can go to Steiger, S-T-E-I-G-E-R.org. Awesome, brother. I love that. And for those of you who might be running on a treadmill or driving down the road, um, uh, we'll have links to the book. We'll have links to Steiger, um, Aaron's organization, and, and his ministry in the uh, toolkit for this episode, which you can find at pastorsurve.org slash network. We'll have links there for that. Um, Aaron, as we wind down, I want to give you an opportunity uh, just to, to speak to your brothers and sisters on the front lines of ministry. Um, what are some words of encouragement that you would have for them? I just think that I, I know so many pastors whose hearts are truly broken for this next generation. And, and often it's a very personal thing. Like this is often people in our own family we're talking about. And I, I can just tell you from our own experience that they're not as far gone as you might think. Like they're, 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 I've seen so many people in our ministry because we have the privilege of, of this is what we do day in, day out. So many people who you would thought are beyond reach. They're like, you know, they're, they're, they're pro-choice activists deep in the scene, encounter Jesus, lives transformed, all that kind of stuff. And so they're, they're, I, I guess I want to just encourage you that, that the gospel is as relevant today as ever. It is what people are looking for. They've just been confused by the culture. And that if we can find ways to present the gospel, I mean, I, I talk a lot about the, the, if I can real quick, the, the cultural felt needs of our day of loneliness and anxiety and sexual brokenness. Jesus meets those needs, right? Confusion. Jesus brings truth to the confused. He brings healing to the sexually broken. He brings peace that transcends understanding. He brings the ultimate relationship with the creator and the church. We have the answer that this generation is crying out for. They're just not coming to the church. We got to mobilize our people to go to them. They will respond. They are hungry. They are open. So that would be my challenge. Yeah, I love that, Aaron. I love that. Great word of hope. Brother, thank you so much for making that time to hang out with us. I uh, appreciate you. I encourage people to uh, check out your new book, Not Beyond Reach, and uh, to be praying about how God can open up some conversations and uh, how we can engage younger generations with the gospel. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Now, before you go, I want to remind you of an incredible free resource that our team puts together every single week to help you and your team dig more deeply and maximize the conversation that we just had. This is the weekly toolkit that we provide, and we understand that it's one thing to listen or watch uh, an episode, but it's something entirely different to actually take what you've heard, what you've watched, what you've seen, and apply it to your life and to your ministry. You see, Front Stage Backstage is more than just a podcast or YouTube show about ministry leadership. We are a complete resource to help train you and your entire ministry team as you seek to grow and develop in life and ministry. Every single week, we provide a weekly toolkit which has all types of tools in it to help you do just that. Now you can find this at pastorserve.org network. 
That's pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find all of our shows, all of our episodes, and all of our weekly toolkits. Now, inside the toolkit are several tools, including video links and audio links for you to share with your team. There are resource links about different resources and tools that were mentioned in the conversation, several other tools. But the greatest thing is the Ministry Leaders Growth Guide. Our team pulls key insights and concepts from every conversation with our amazing guests. And then we also create engaging questions for you and your team to consider and process, providing space for you to reflect on how that episode's topic relates to your unique context at your local church, in your ministry, and in your life. Now you can use these questions in your regular staff meetings to guide your conversation as you invest in the growth of your ministry leaders. You can find the weekly toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. We encourage you to check out that free resource. Until next time, I'm Jason Day, encouraging you to love well, live well, and lead well. God bless.